Hey there, friendlies. How's up? Welcome to uh, another in my sort of <laughs> irregular uh, series of panel discussions. Tonight, we're going to talk about paddling safety. Um, I have some guests with me, uh, the first of whom is a regular on the live streams, who's very active in the side chat, and that's Mr. Mark Putmans, who has been a paddling instructor before, but is not right now. Say hi, Mark. Hello, everyone. Uh, the next is, of course, Mr. Pine Martin, who has been on my live streams before, and he's an avid paddler and knows many, many things about it. Say hi, Martin. Good evening. And uh, the last <laughs> is well known both uh, on my live streams and everywhere else. It's Mr. Kevin Callen, author and paddler and TV personality and stuff. Say hi, mister. No, the only reason I said I'd be on is because Pine Martin was going to be on, and I said, you know, I was supposed to be in the woods right now, and I said, no way. I backpedaled, backpedaled to make sure I'm here. You got to make sure Martin's, you know, you got to keep him on the straight and narrow. Oh, you got to. You got to watch supposed that. Supposed to be in the woods. Who are you? Uh, we, we actually, um, I was supposed to be on tour right now, and there was a, well, it's not a snowstorm, but everybody's all, oh, well, yeah, there's the snow, so we're not going, and we, 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 changed the plan. And then I said, well, you know, I, I better go back because I know Pine Martin will get all upset and he'll be crying by now if I know not on the show with him. Yeah. Oh. Drowning his sorrows. Drowning his sorrows in Auchentoshan. Um, in honor of Kevin and uh, Martin, I am not drinking beer tonight. I'm drinking whiskey, a fine Canadian rye. One of the only fine Canadian ryes. Ooh, ooh, wait a minute. I... Let's not get political, though. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> um so while he's uh well uh kevin's looking for a bottle i'll just explain the reason i wanted to do this uh this show is because of the recent tragedy at uh opiongo um and i saw well there you go all right that's legit yeah um, you know what made me get this because i was cleaning my closet and i found this this is my uh jacket from college when I graduated from forestry. Oh, forestry. Okay. So you're an old forester. 1979, 1980. So I bought this. As a celebration. Um, well, in that case, cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. I don't think even, is, I don't think it actually fits me anymore, though. Wait a minute. Well, Kevin's seeing if he still fits into that. Um, I'll say, um, I read a blog post by one of the people who was a rescuer at that um, at that tragedy. Let's be honest, and oh, I have oh, linked God. it in the, like, in the show notes. Yeah. All right, you look like uh, an extra from Greece, but like Greece oh, thirty years God. later. Yeah, that doesn't fit me at all. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I figured you know the canoe safety thing sort of gets me where I live because the full extent of my training in a canoe came from like a harried you know uh, um air force lieutenant when i was in the cadets and you know I, i've said to kevin off off screen before that you know i got taught this half-assed j stroke and you know it it was a very sort of low low quality instruction and you know cadets are between the age of 12 and 18 and I am two years away from 50. So that was a long time ago. And yet I like getting into a canoe and getting out there. And I, it's it sort of ever since that event, you know, I, I want to be doing a lot more canoeing in the, uh, sorry, but I'm putting cream on my hands. guys. Um, but like, it makes me wonder about training and about, uh, you know, if there's a sense of responsibility anywhere when, when a tragedy happens. And I figured I know some, some guys who are very skilled in the paddling world and I think I'd want to talk to them and I would love to talk to them in front of you guys. So that, that's what tonight's about. Um, I had reached out to uh, the person who wrote that, that blog post. Um, but she is not up to, uh, it's not a good night for her and her husband is not interested in speaking to any media types anymore uh, because there was an Ottawa citizen article about the event and it got a few things wrong and uh, oh. I don't blame him for not wanting to be on. So no hard feelings. Um, I do just want to say hi to everyone. We got Adam Romano explores grace. Of course, Serge, Serge, 
I'm not even pouring a beer tonight. Obviously, Pine Martin's here. Simon, comment ça va? Have an outdoorsy guy. Hey, buddy. Um, Jonathan Milley. Nice. We got a good group. Group? We got a good group. Um, so, I don't know. Like, you guys are all familiar with, with this story, the event that happened here. Um, part of also Pine... Uh, Pine. Fine. Martin, part of the reason I wanted you on this is because of uh, that anecdote that you told me about when you went camping at the Grand Canyon and they kind of had to vet you before they would let you go down because it's, it's dangerous. So I, at one point tonight, I really want to get into if there's should be responsibility here or there. Um, but I'm interested in everyone's just first thoughts right off the bat. So I don't know who wants to go first. All right, Mark. Go. I'd like to point out something. If first thoughts is we're we're talking about a topic that involves the death of somebody, we're talking about the successful rescue of two people. That's the most important part. That is really, really essential to get across. There's a rescuer out there who has done his utter best. I've done many, many rescues. Very few of them involved life or death right there in the moment but I've done so many hundreds of rescues that I'm well over a thousand, partly because I was doing whitewater paddling and we were taking beginners in there and they're flipping over upside down all the time and they never roll back up again. They come out of their boat, you have to take them to shore. Uh, somebody who's going to do a rescue almost on their own. I mean, he had help at the end and it's really good that there was help around. Um, there was so much on that one gentleman's shoulders uh, to put out maximum effort for the kind of time he did. I've known some people who've been in that circumstance who did permanent damage to their body, and we hope this gentleman has not done so. But, um, but I think the focus, I, I know what you want to talk about, Jesse. We have to remember that um, that somebody died in this circumstance, and we have to respect that and their families and the people that were involved. And the people that were on the lake that day, all the rescuers, it wasn't just one rescuer. It was a team of people that were in canoes on the shore. Uh, it was the Opiongo Lake uh, team from um, out, I can't remember the name of the outfitter. And it was the ambulance attendants and the police that were involved. Um, it, it's not a trivial topic, unfortunately, you know, and it when it gets real, it's even more serious. Yeah, and it's, it, it is important. Um especially online, whenever something happens, you've always got some guy saying, you know, uh, letting beginners on and just starting to get a little, and uh, I, I figured that we're not going to sort of go there. Um, I, I, especially because my skills are very, very beginner. And yet I still really like paddling around. I'm, I have way more experience as a, um, uh, uh, what's the word, a kayak than, than in a canoe, but yep. I mean, not having the experience doesn't mean I'm not going to get in a canoe. Exactly. But, you know, I especially... An, an organization that's renting a canoe to you, Jess, would want to assume that you're competent rather than assuming that you're incompetent. And maybe ask a few questions and make sure you've... Have you got your life jacket? You got your spare paddle? And and from there, really be on the trusting side rather than on the non-trusting side, because that makes them look bad as a business if they're not trusting their their client base. And that's a part of the industry that exposes people like what happened this particular Thanksgiving to a slightly higher risk. And, you know, we're talking about adventure. We're talking about paddling on cool water lakes. That's adventure. There's always going to be some risk. And sometimes risk plays a Murphy and somebody gives their life for it. Okay. So let's, let's get some thoughts from, uh, from the rest of the panel. Who, who would like to go next? No, you're both being so polite and Canadian. Martin, <laughs> well, why don't you say something? Okay. Um, well, I mean, something struck me when I, when I read this, uh, first of all, I always, like most people, I, I, I feel a mixture of outrage and, and, tragedy right i feel sort of like oh no some poor soul lost his life out there right and he didn't just lose his life he was out there with i think there were three canoes all together um and uh two people were fished out of the water i think they were out three canoes one of them rolled one of them turned over and yep. there were three of them in the water and there were three in that canoe i think yeah that's right and two of them were rescued by that gentleman 
uh, who, whose efforts have to be described as nothing short of a road. But then one gentleman, there had to be, I mean, this guy, this kayaker had to tow these people back to shore. They had to hang on to the back, the stern of his, of his kayak while he paddled. I mean, it's really hard paddling in wind and waves, which is what he was doing. Uh, and a considerable distance, I mean, considerable distances to, to get to them, considerable distance to, to haul a person to shore, then to go back out into the water uh, and haul another person back and then haul, go, go back again to pick up the third person and then try to get that. I mean, uh, yeah, we're talking about hours and hours of, of effort. Yeah, this is just exhausting. I mean, uh, just to get back to the docks in order to get help with something like a seven kilometer paddle. It's just a long way. Yeah. In. Even with the wind at your back, that would be exhausting. Um, if you have to do it in a hurry, a sustained, I mean, he's, it's not like you're lily dipping and you just stop, right? So right. part of that is, I, mean, I sort of filled with admiration for that gentleman, of course, uh, but and it, it filled with a sense of tragic loss. But it's funny because my immediate reaction when reading that is, oh, not again, not someone who's gone out there and, and you know, without experience, with proper equipment and not know how, right? But of and course, that, well, that's not the first person that Opiongo's taken either. Uh, no, it's a very treacherous uh, lake. It's a huge lake. Um, there's a huge uh, amount of fetch that is wind that gathers and collects. Uh, you get big waves. And they don't always look like big waves either. That's a, it's kind of a funny lake. Um, uh, very often when there's a, you get big waves, you, you, you'll see white caps and they look big. They look ominous. And they don't always look that way uh, on some lakes. And Opiongo is one of those where you can get some really, really big waves, but they're kind of big and rolling. They, they're just as treacherous, right? But they don't look like they're breaking, and so they they, they don't look as intimidating. Um, and and I've, uh, just, uh, I've been uh, tricked uh, by uh, waves uh, like that. In a, I, I used to crew on a 30-foot sailboat, hmm. uh, a laker, not in the ocean, but um, even like if you're in the middle of the lake, like every now and again, a wave hits that was a lot bigger than you thought. And if you're side onto it rather than bow into it it can be a little uh yeah funny. if you get broadsided by a wave like that you get yeah. these weird waves these road waves that come at odd angles that you're not expecting and the next yeah. thing you know you get broadsided by that and then it just takes a little wave to knock you over yeah uh, but the, the, the thing is about this i think everybody in the paddling community feels a little moment of like ah you know you should know better and that's the curmudgeon in us that's yeah. the person who has had some experience who knows um, a little bit about it, and then looks back in harsh condemnation and judgment. Uh, and of course, I took some chances when I was learning, uh, chances I didn't know I was taking because I was too green and I was just too experienced. And that's um, what I'm afraid of. And I think that's what happened in this instance. You had some people who, were, who uh, may have paddled before, may not, uh, uh, probably had done some paddling before, but not, not much. Um, didn't realize that they were biting off way more than they could chew on that on that lake. Uh, didn't weigh the risks versus the consequences. This is something right. that I that I learned in a whitewater canoe course. It's a it's a simple thing. It's kind of obvious, but you always have to uh, weigh risks versus consequences. If the risk is very very high, you probably don't want to do it. But you can probably right. risk it if the consequences are very low. But if the risks are high, like like falling into uh, cold waters autumn temperature waters on a big lake um, and you're not a great swimmer, the consequences are high. So even if the risk is very, very low, I wouldn't take that risk. Uh, right. And right. that's one of those things is we don't, we, we think in terms of what are the chances of this happening? It's not just a matter of what are the chances of this happening, it's what are the effects if it happens, no matter how small the chances are, right? right. Is, 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 this, is this lethal? If, you know, if I wipe out in these rapids, is this going to be lethal? Am I going to destroy my boat and have to hike out of the bush? Am I going to need a, uh, an air rescue? So you have to balance risk versus consequences. But that is something I, I don't think that, that we have instinctively. It's something that you have to sort of uh, either learn through experience or you have it explained to you and then pickled into you long enough that you look at situations like this in those terms. And I, you know, so it, I think it's natural to feel a, a moment of bile when you hear about something like this and just condemn the victim uh, in, in this kind of thing. But it doesn't take much to sort of cast your mind back to when you were way less experienced in these matters. And it would have been you, just as easily been you or someone you love. Yep. Yeah. I'm just taking a look over the, um, the, the blog post again just to make sure that uh, we're not missing anything. Um, 
and one thing that that Krista said in in the blog post is that there, there might. You know what? I want to hear what Kevin has to say before I go into this. Um, I, I you know, it's, it's uh, well, I, I don't have much to say, which is uh, yeah, I'm here like, really, what the guy ever does to me. Um, it's, it's, have, have another drink. No, I, I, I was drinking tea before this. Um, uh, it's it's really a tough one because I was out on that weekend and I was out on that Saturday and I was on a secluded bay and it was windy as hell and right. uh it was beautiful out the, the weather was nice but the water was cold i also know exactly where it happened on obiongo and that that exact spot has taken a lot of, a lot of people um for a lot of reasons whether whether it's lack of experience or wanting to keep going and we're fine or the the zeal of the the area that you're at, you're, you're you're in um but the thing is when i as soon as i got home I, I got home on the monday and i do a lot of media stuff and cbc was on me um like no tomorrow and say well we got to talk about this i didn't even know about it so my reaction was i'm not talking about it because i don't know what's going on and i was not there i do not know what happened and i was not there when it happened so i have no opinion um so i didn't go on uh any live show, uh, and I had a lot to do with. I just didn't want to deal with it too because I'm thinking, son of a, oh, someone died again. Jeez, uh, well, like Martin was saying, and I don't know what was going on. I, I I know exactly where the spot was, and I can see how it happened. Even if I didn't even know the circumstance, I know the spot. You uh, know the lake. Yeah, yes. and I know that spot too. It's the V. And okay. Yeah. There's so many people that, that have, have been in on so, that. So, uh, Kevin, for people who who don't know Obiongo at all, why don't you just sort of describe where, because the, the whole lake is like, it's roughly a Y shape, right? Uh, well, no, it's a, tear, it's a teardrop and goes into a Y. So what, what that part is, is that it, it opens up. So as a paddler, whether you're experienced or not, you have two choices. You either go way to the left or way, way, way to the right to keep to the shore, or you just go right across. And you're going to go right across if you're like, you're kidding me. I'm not doing that. And then you get a quarter of the way, probably not even half the way, and the wind picks up and in seconds, in seconds. I would say in less than four minutes. If it picks up, you're done. You're, you're finished. Because yeah. it's very, very deep, really, really deep. And, I mean, it would be worse if it was shallow. Shallow lakes, big shallow lakes are worse, uh, like 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 to miss me. Um, the waves curl before mm -hmm. they roll. And so it'll, it'll top you over quicker, right? Right. So um, I did read about the the kayaker um, pulling them to shore, and I, I you know read about the uh, the canoeists trying. Again, I'm not. I wasn't there, so I have no idea what was going on. But I do know people try to save them, and I do know that actually, you know, should they have been out there? Well, it was a really nice sunny day. It was a really windy day, but it was a really nice sunny day, and it was full of autumn bloom, right? So it was beautiful mm -hmm. to be out there. And we're telling everybody to be out, to be out there. It's beautiful. We all should be out there. Yeah. And yes, yeah, accidents are going to happen. Um, and like Pi Martin said, like in my youth, I've done some really stupid stuff, especially on Obiongo too. And it happens. Um, I just really feel bad for that family because we can all judge and say, this is what we, we should have done. This is what they should have done. We were never there. So we can't judge at all. All I know is, um, we don't want to stop people going out there and we don't want everybody to say we shouldn't go out there because the people are dying. That's yeah. what we really should be looking at. Right. Um, the, 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 the 401, the highway is far more dangerous than Obiongo Lake. Okay. Well, I, um, that's a good point. You know, I, I, let's face it. People die on the roads way more often than they die flying and swimming and being eaten by sharks and all that stuff. But maybe because of that, dying in a traffic accident has become kind of mundane. Whereas a story like this, because it happens so much more seldomly, just checking my grammar there, um, is a bigger story. You know, well, I mean, it, a, if I can interrupt, there's a statistical fallacy at play here. I mean, you know, I'm sure that day there were probably more people that died on our highways in Ontario than died in any of our parks uh, or backcountry camping. 
So we have okay. one death that we know of. Probably weren't any others that day backcountry camping of any kind. But there were surely more deaths than that on our highways, right? But the number of people yeah. on our highways on in any given minute is in the millions, right? And there just aren't that many people in the backcountry, right? Yeah. So it is, you, it's not a fair comparison to say way more people die. Uh, it is still nevertheless objectively true that it is more dangerous uh, on the highways than uh, in the backcountry. Uh, I mean, even when you correct for the number of people on our highways, um, but, uh, you know, it, it's easy to sort of poo-poo it as not dangerous. The fact is there are dangers out in the backcountry and it's not the bears and it's not the wolves and right. There are bear, there are dangers associated uh, with, with wildlife really, but really the dangers are trips and falls, scalds and burns, drowning, hypothermia, right. And drowning hypothermia. Those were the two operative things here, right. Hypothermia, certainly. Um, well, that that's what did this this canoeist in. In fact, in the end, yeah, he didn't actually drown. I mean, he was he was successfully pulled onto a rescue boat, but it, it was just he was too cold and he he, uh, he died of hypothermia. Um, I don't know if he might have been unconscious by the time he was on. I I don't remember, and I'm not going to go and read it now while we're on uh, while we're on screen. But there's a there's a link in the side chat that I think Martin, did you put that there? Yeah, I put that there. There's, okay. there's so what I put was the blog post. Yep. The, uh, so there was a blog entry written by the gentleman, the rescuer himself, the first, a first person account mm -hmm. is on account of what happened. Uh, very detailed, uh, yep. uh, very, very sober and reflective. Um, I, I was really touched when I read it. Uh, and it was posted by his wife, sort of broadcast uh, by his yep. wife. Uh, and the initial news stories that came out were too vague and filled with inaccuracies. And somewhat misleading. Not, I don't think intentionally. I just think people got the facts wrong. Bit of sloppy reporting there. Um, and then there's a, um, a uh, Ottawa Citizen article that's much more detailed. That seems to be based on the blog entry. It uh, seems much more accurate. Uh, but you said that um, the gentleman in question who did the rescuing and who authored the blog post um, that he was dissatisfied with the news story. So I don't know in what respect the news story is discrepant from his own account or from what actually happened, but apparently there's some. Yeah, there, there's, I, you know, I, I've written for newspapers before, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a former um, freelance journalist and we no longer live in a world where you've got dedicated fact checkers in the newsrooms, in many, many newsrooms, you know, so people are not messing up the story because they want to, they're not messing it up even necessarily due to laziness. You know, it's just, there's no budget there to make sure that every story that goes out is rock solid. And we're in a very, very bad time for journalism because I believe in journalism. I believe in, in, in a free press. You know, I, I think the whole fake news thing or, you know, Oh, the mainstream media, I, I think it's all like red herrings by people with, you know, uh, which you're not saying Martin, but, um, I know that it's really hard sometimes to get to make sure that the story gets out right, especially these days. Uh, but the thing is, if you if you did something like this gentleman did, and the story that gets out there is not the right story, obviously you're going to be pissed about it. And, and once the story is out there, it's too late to really fix it in in the the, the in the public view. You know, you can put out a retraction, you can put out a correction, you can blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, the first the first version of a story to hit the uh, the airwaves or the, the street is the one that sticks to the wall. So, yeah. you know, I think. I think I think the logical people, uh, powders out there, even just logical people out there are thinking, OK, look, he had a PFD on. So immediately you want to say, well, he didn't have a PFD on. That's what happened. We, we need to stop that, which I'm not saying we like, we do need to stop that. Um, people need to wear PFDs, but he had one on. Then they said, well, it was dark blue. It wasn't bright. So therefore we, we wouldn't be able to find him. It's hard to see him. Yeah. Well, they did find him and they tried to get him ashore. And, he, and he, again, I was not there. So I'm not, I'm, I'm just, um, hypothesizing. And they're like saying it was dark blue, so they, they wouldn't be able to see him. The, the, the thing is, though, it's like, okay, well, you know what? Um, he wanted to be out there. <laughs> he wanted to go on a, on a canoe trip. He wanted to yep. experience the wilderness. And Obiango said, hey, not today. That's not going to happen. And it reminded us that we have to really think about that before we go out, especially that time of year. Hypothermia is the killer. Um, it really is. 
Uh, I, I, I just hope to God that his, his family um, and loved ones want to still go out on a canoe trip after this uh, because, you know, yeah. Yeah, because that that in some ways adds to the tragedy. If these people miss out on possibly a long and 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 happy future of of enjoying the, the outdoors, because of let's face it, a very very tragic event, you know. And, and that maybe, if I may interrupt, and that maybe if the family does want to keep paddling, that they'll be willing to take a course. Um, or two, and or that three. that's an interesting thing that you brought up. This is something that I kind of don't want to talk about, but it, it might be important that Krista said that there was very possibly um, a language barrier thing, and she in fact brings up because Krista is um, an outdoors um, instructor that maybe in in our multicultural world there should be instruction available in different languages in in a province like Ontario or Quebec, where the fact is. Uh, hell of a lot of people speak a different language uh, you know i'm not here to make a decision on that because there's money involved right but it's like i don't know how to answer that one because obviously there should be instruction in multiple languages obviously like whatever the, the top three languages in a given province but the people hitting the the outdoors don't constitute necessarily a big enough group to say you have an English instructor, a French instructor, one in Spanish, one in, would you pick Mandarin or Cantonese if it's a Chinese language instructor? Like, how do you keep these instructors paid and on staff kind of thing? I mean, maybe that's sort of beyond the, the, the wheelhouse of this conversation, but. Well, there's one sort of interesting thing like about when people from the city, and it's my understanding these people were from the, the greater Toronto area who'd come up for uh, for that uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah. I, mean, I live in a, a little tourist town. Um, I'm not gonna say where I live, but I, I live literally two minutes from the shore of, of a river right here in Muskoka. And there's an outfitter minutes from my door. And they rent canoes all the time, all season long. And they give some basic pointers uh, to people who are renting a canoe for the first time, for instance. I have witnessed it many times where the people renting the canoe just like, no, no, it's okay. I know, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Now, what are you supposed to do when you're an outfitter and you're renting a canoe? They're not going into the backcountry. They're just going for, you know, a paddle for like 45 minutes an hour on this local river here, right, you know, right in front of the docks through town. Uh, but I see people yeah. literally getting into the stern seat facing backwards, right? Um, we, uh, we've probably all seen that. It's, it's, it's sort of high comedy when it happens, right? And sometimes I will, like, if I'm there, I'll say, oh, hang on, <laughs> you need to turn around and you need to sit over there, um, and that kind of thing. But it happens all the time. I mean, it happens every single weekend in this town. People don't want to be instructed. They refuse even a few pointers. Um, they are required by law to have a PFD in the boat, one for every passenger. They're not required to wear them. Uh, and they can't be made to wear them. And on a hot day, people don't want to wear them. I, and I, that, that's true of sailing too, by the way. When yeah. we sail, well, when I used to sail, we would have, we'd make sure that there were PFDs on board, but we weren't wearing them. Yeah. But, you know, I we would usually make sure that they were within easy reach. But, you know, if, if you get hit by a, you're not going to get hit by that big a wave, you know, <clears throat> in the lakes around here. But if you get hit by something big and those PFDs go overboard and then your boat bails. Wow. That was useful, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. so maybe there should be a, 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 um, a legislation change there. I, Jesse, I you've never seen a small sailboat run, a, run aground inadvertently and three people out of the four on board go flying into the water, hurting themselves while going. Yeah. Yeah, and, the know, boat I was on, the 30 footer I was on went from four knots to a dead stop on a massive freaking rock. Yeah. Wow. I was, I, I, I had to run downstairs, um, uh, down below, and I was like ripping up the, uh, the floorboards to make sure we weren't taking it on water at the same time as my wife called me to give me crap about something. She's <laughs> like, I really got to speak to you about this. I'm like, honey, I just, and she, she didn't understand what I was going on about. And I finally had to say, we hit a massive rock. I'm making sure we're not sailing, uh, we're not sinking. I'll call you in 10 minutes. Wow. Click, but fortunately, the only ma the may start again. The only major damage was was to the um, the keel. 
Mm. You know, big hunk of lead, it, you know, it could be fixed with a lot of heat <laughs> and some very careful. Um, but yeah, I, things happen and we could have all been thrown right overboard because as I said, we were sailing at four knots and then suddenly dead stop. And if it hadn't been for, um, you know, all the, the lines and everything around the, the edge of the boat, phew, I would have been in the water. No PFD. So yeah, I understand perfectly. Um, and it's funny because when somebody falls off a boat, I, I still think, dude, come on, you know, at least, a t you know, put a line on you. Um, I'm going to invite avid outdoorsy guy on because uh, I think he might have things to say, but um, I do want Martin, since you're talking about this, uh, maybe we'll talk about the, the sort of, maybe there's a responsibility thing or maybe there isn't here because of um, I was watching a Ray Mears episode where he was going through like into the Australian outback and like at the, it's like the last sign of civilization before the road goes, you know, out into the nothing, there's a pub where people, you know, sign their name, what the date is and they're going and like a few phone numbers. If we're not back by this day, it's not a government run thing. It's just what you do. And so the guy has your name in a book so that if someone doesn't come back, he's like, okay, Matt, got a number, got to make a call. And that seems to me to be a, a, a case where obviously it's a very dangerous road you're about to take. If you, if your car breaks down out in the middle of nowhere, good luck. And someone has decided to step in where no one else would. And I was thinking about what you were saying about that camping trip you did to the Grand Canyon. And I, I want, I want to hear about that because um, the conversation that you had to have with the people at the Grand Canyon was interesting to me. Sure. Okay. So this was many years ago. It was decades ago. My wife and I were in university. We were undergraduates and then uh, we took off a semester. We wanted to travel through the Southwest and see a lot of sites and backpack around. One of the places we chose was the Grand Canyon. Um, I knew that the Grand Canyon saw a lot of tourists and we needed to book ahead. My wife insisted, no, 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 we're going in you know, October, November, there'll be nobody there. <laughs> well, we get there and of course, <laughs> there's lots of people there. <laughs> any, any day of the year, there's lots of people there. And there's only so many campsites available at the bottom of the canyon where you can camp. I mean, there are RV campsites at the, at, at the rims on the north rim and south rim where you can camp. And, tent sites and stuff like that. That's not a problem, but limited real estate at the bottom of the canyon, right? Uh, where you can only do back, uh, backpacking, basically, tenting. Um, so we didn't have reservations, so we weren't getting in. Uh, so someone told us though, well, look, there's always cancellations and no-shows. So just right. show up early tomorrow morning. So that, that the morning that we wanted to go in, that's what we did. We went, right. walked in early, we had all our gear, we were ready to go in, and we said, we want to go in, is it, is it available? And they said, yes, there's there's a spot for you. Um, so they only let a certain number in, and we made that that number. But before they let us in, they said, oh, 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 you can't just walk into the Grand Canyon. Everyone thinks this is an amusement park. This is not an amusement park. This is a deadly place. Um, this is an inside out mountain. When you climb a mountain, you exhaust yourself on your way up, and you take it easy on the way down. This is an inside out mountain. You're going to shred your legs uh, and feet on the way down, putting the brakes on the whole way down a steep hill. And then you have to climb out when you're sore. Um, it's not an easy in, easy out. It's an eight hour day to get to the bottom of that unless you're an extremely fit hiker. And it's a desert environment. Uh, it gets very little rain, very, very dry. You can fall off of a cliff. I mean, you've got a sheer cliff on one side and a sheer drop on the other as you're going through this carved trail along this, this, this wall. And it's quite uh, narrow. It's right. very narrow. It's, it's wide enough for a mule. <laughs> um, and it's really tricky when you're going up and the mules are coming down or vice versa. And then you got to find a way. Uh, and you have to be on the outside and let the mules squeeze in against the wall. Um, uh, and, and the mules, these are mules that are, that are taking people in and out a short distance or, or the whole way. So we were backpacking uh, in. So they told us everything that we would uh, encounter. Um, and when we did go down, there was literally a sign that said, uh, South Kaibab Trail, no water, no shade, no fun. Right? <laughs> that gives you a, 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 a feel for how tough a, a hike this is. I mean, people do it all the time, you know, for a very, very experienced 
extremely fit hiker, it's great. But we were pretty fit. We were in our 20s, and it beat the hell out of us. But what was interesting uh, in this little talk that they gave us was there were these um, kind of these like the office dividers, you know, those felt walls that you have in office. Cubicle uh, dividers. Cubicle. Yeah, cubicle, wall. yeah, cubicle dividers. There was, there was several of them there. <clears throat> and on them were Polaroids. Back This was in the days where people still had Polaroids, right? Um, and they were all photographs of dead bodies found in the canyon over the years. Wow. Right. These are all the people that wandered off the trail, got lost, got disoriented. People who died of, of um, hyperthermia because it just got too cold. And, it, um, and they had to stop and then they froze overnight because it gets cold in the desert at night. People who died mm -hmm. of dehydration. People who fell to their deaths because they took a misstep because they were just too tired and exhausted or dizzy from the sun and the heat. And, they dropped to their death, just body after body. It was absolutely chilling. So that was kind of interesting. It was like incredibly sobering. So our perspective on that hike went from, we're going to take a walk down to the bottom of the canyon and pitch our tent to we're in for a grueling hike through a dangerous terrain that, and, and we're unfamiliar with desert camping and hiking. We need to take this seriously. Now, fortunately, we had the right footwear. We were fine. People people lose their, their toenails. They go in with their sneakers, and that's just not enough. There's too much play and wiggle, and your toenails get ripped off. It's horrible. Um, and we actually met someone who lost a toenail. They were on the way out as we were on the way in. They'd lost a toenail on the way on the way in. Um, so you can imagine how that feels, uh, hiking out of there, because there's no air rescue. You know? um, well, there is air rescue, but it costs thousands of dollars. So. Um, anyway, so it, I don't know that every outfitter can possibly afford to do something like that. I mean, this will turn away business. This is a national park. You know, they're yeah, federally yeah. funded. Um, they have a, a guaranteed uh, tourist flow that they don't have to worry about. So uh, I don't think we can do anything like that. Uh, but there are things that I think we should do. I honestly am in favor of legislating uh, PFD usage. I mean, we do it for seat belts, you know. I don't see why we can't do it for PFDs. I don't. I don't. Can't think of a, of a sound medical reason why you can't wear a PFD. Um, you know, so it, it just seems to me you always ought to wear one. It doesn't matter what the what the temperature is. I wear one. It doesn't matter how hot it gets. It gets hot. There, are, you know, there are good and bad PFDs. Some are, you know, breathe better than others. Some are a lot more airflow than others. Um, but I, I think that would go a long way. It would not have helped in this instance. In this instance, it was just the amount of time spelled, spent in the water and it was too cold. And you know, a lot of us have taken these courses where they teach you how to do a canoe over canoe rescue. You always learn that in flat water conditions. Try that in the slightest wave. Try it, try it, okay? You, I, I, I'll bet money, I'll bet money. It doesn't, I, how experienced you are, I don't care. Go out, go ahead and do it. And I practiced that. Uh, you know, we, my wife and I went out camping with friends and we'd go canoeing together. And, you know, when we're at a campsite, you know, we'd go and we'd practice rolling our canoes and let's do a canoe over canoe rescue. And it was all fun. And, you know, if you've ever had just water in your canoe, never mind having rolled your canoe, if you've ever had taken on water, ship water, let's say you're splashing through waves or you, the, the gunnel went down just for a moment and let water ship in or something like that, if you, or, or just tons of rain and there's a a significant amount of water in your boat, just a couple of inches. When that stuff starts to slosh around, and that's what happens in a canoe. A canoe does this, right? Yeah. With every slosh, that thing heals your heals your boat over back and forth. It's very easy to 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 lose control. So even if you fall out of your boat and you manage to right your boat, there's going to be water in that boat, and there's going to be wind and waves blowing that boat around and, and tossing that boat. Now you have to try to get in by yourself. You pretty much forget it in those conditions. Um, but if you've got help and you have someone who can counterbalance by holding onto the opposite gunnels and hold the boat uh, while you climb in, you have a chance. But now you're in the boat with water sloshing around in there. Now you have to bail like crazy while people stabilize the boat for you, right? right. It would take three people with considerable experience, um, uh, considerable difficulty to get themselves back into a boat that way. And what we had here were three people with Poor swimming skills, probably no rescue, self-rescue um, knowledge at all. Uh, they wouldn't have had a chance anyway. But I honestly, I think most skilled people would not have had a chance, uh, or not much of a chance in those conditions. Right. The best thing to do there is just get to shore, 
get to shore. If there's no rescue in sight, get away from that boat, get, get yourself to shore. You've got to get out of that water because that water is what's going to kill you. And you can't just wait around hoping to be seen. It's really astonishing that they, there happened to be a little flotilla of people, kayaks, who had passed them already. And one woman happened to see them, told her husband, and yeah. he went, and he was like extremely experienced and has done rescues before. And he went to investigate. And it's because of that bit of luck that there happened to be someone on the water within visual range of them who was a, and who had the necessary skills that any of them got out of that alive. Because yeah, if, 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 if everything hadn't happened exactly the way it did, there might have been three corpses right now instead of one. I'm, I'm confident there would have been. I, I don't think they had the skill to swim that distance, right? Yeah, I, I certainly don't think so. Um, I want to say uh, welcome to the panel, to uh, Mr. Avid Outdoorsy Guy. Uh, Kevin looks like he wants to say something. He, no, I, like, I actually am. I'm, I'm, I'm opposite. I'm. I, really? Uh, I, I, I think the only thing in my in my mind that's bouncing back and forth in my brain is um, the language barrier thing that we meant that someone had mentioned, and I get that because I've, I've I've dealt with that before. There's language barrier, but it's a language barrier because they don't understand our language. Like like Elvison is their fault. Like um, I w w when they're in the water, it, there's no language barrier. Like there, there's symbols you can do. Like uh it, it it's nothing to do with english language uh of why you need rescued so right. again though i was not there so i can't judge or even say anything but i think the language barrier i think experience level is an issue and um that's pandora's box i mean does everybody have to take a course like they have to take a, a powerboat uh course to go out in a powerboat well that's been going on back and forth forever right should canoeists or paddlers say kayak kayaks and uh and canoeists actually have to take a course well paddle boat people will tell you that that didn't teach them anything i don't know if you've ever taken that course but it's a pretty easy course right uh but they it, they it happened because there were so many deaths so should that happen should we force to wear our life jackets uh Camp Christina, she was the first to tell me about this incident when I got back. She was very upset and she wanted to create a whole program to force everybody to wear PFDs. And I said, well, you're going to have to have everybody in, in jet, jet boats and uh, um, power boats to wear them first. And she goes, really? I went, well, you can't, can't just have canoes wear them <laughs> and everybody else not. That's not going to happen. So it, it's, um, it's a nightmare. Uh, I, I actually don't agree. I, I think I don't think that's that, that's right. It seems to me that we could craft legislation that self-powered uh, craft, you know, vessels, you know, paddle boards, uh, canoes, kayaks. Uh, those people uh, should have to because it's really hard to write those boats. Well, you judging get back in but, but Fremier, you're judging when you say that. You're saying that actually only us should wear them and not power boats. Like that's not going to happen in the real world. Like. Well, it's not. It's not going to happen as long as people say what you're saying. <laughs> well, if enough people say saying, what I'm saying, not, yeah, it I'm could happen. It seems to I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying that is never going to happen. There's yeah, no I, way that you're going to have just canoeists wearing PFDs and powerboats and jet. Well, no, like, people are going to balk. Way that's people, are gonna, people are going to balk, but people balked at high seatbelts. I mean, that was that was hard to get people to go along with, right? And and we're doing it now. Um, and now. And then we had to make exceptions there too. You know, what about children on school buses? No seatbelts. Cab drivers, no seatbelts. You know, I hate, I hate to tell you, Martin. I disagree with you on this one thing for several reasons. I'm interested. Yeah. And, and you're right. And my, I myself, when I get in a kayak or canoe, I work hard enough that I'm hot. And if I'm wearing a PFD, I'm dangerously hot. Now I'm splashing myself, which is fine, but if you're splashing your hands all the time and you're gonna paddle for eight or 10 hours in a day, your hands are like oatmeal at the end of the day and you can't even open a can of soup, you know, cause your hands are so soggy. You can't do up a zipper and stuff like that. Um, so I, I think there has to be some leeway uh, generally speaking, uh, Transport Canada and, and the industry has promoted people to wear them. And one of the reasons they started saying that, well, we're going to sell blue life jackets and black uh, water skiing life jackets is because people will wear them more. 
rather than you know having the yum yum yellow ones that attract sharks or the bright orange ones that were the standard back in the 60s and 70s. They had to be a bright color. So that was a choice that was made by the industry that manufactures the, the PFDs, like Salus, who do a superb job for us in Canada in manufacturing uh, PFDs for us, that are, good for, that are good for paddling, that are good for water skiing, that are good for canoeing, that are good for sailing. Of course, the sailors and the power boaters have the emergency inflatable ones that are just, they're not inflated and you wear them and, yeah, you know, they're, they're supposed to be quite comfortable. I've never had one of those. Uh, so I generally don't wear my PFD if I'm in a group or if it's flat water conditions or if it's warm or that kind of thing. If I'm paddling solo and there's conditions or there's going to be conditions, putting on a paddle, uh, putting on a life jacket out on the water is tricky. And, you know, you're at risk when you've got your hands up inside and you're pulling it down over. And some of them, you know, you've got the hole and you can pull yeah. them over, but not all of them do. Yeah, the keyhole. Yeah, I've got the zipper one, you know, the touring one that has the zipper on the front. So those are fairly easy, but they can be tricky to put on. So I think, I don't know if it's in Canada or in the States. It might be in the States that if you have a life jacket that can be put on like a coat with a zipper, you can leave it off. But if you have the kind that you have to pull over your head, you have to have it on. Yeah, that makes so, sense. it's under a certain age. I think it's underneath under 16 years of age or something like that. Yeah. But that little one that inflates, you know, the one that sort of looks like that seems like it would mitigate a lot of the oh my god, I'm stinking hot factor. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the other thing that happens with a PFD. If people are, you know, youth especially, young people and and even, you know, 20s and 30s, I'm no longer that youth person i'm you know way past uh Still getting in getting all back that, except yeah, for yeah. Uh, ethan getting back into a canoe or a kayak is a lot yeah. more work with a pfd and you sure. know when we when we do whitewater we're always wearing pfds like that's that's not even a question no. uh we're wearing you know pfds and helmets and we're wearing wetsuits for the the zero degree water one degree two degree and you know by the time it's eight or 10 degrees, it's like, we're starting to take layers off and we're wearing short sleeve shirts because we're too warm. And we're, we're rolling on purpose to cool off. And, and there's another place that I'd, I'd like to bring up uh, because I've paddled in that zero degree water and you know, and you see how fast people in the cold, cold water lose dexterity and they can no longer help themselves. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't take long. The statistics say, oh, you've got like 45 minutes. Really? If you're in the water for six minutes in, you know, zero to five degree water, you've lost 50% of your strength and dexterity in your hands. That means you're no longer helping yourself. You can't climb on the back of someone else's kayak without help of a second kayak to help pull them on top. It gets, you know, people go downhill really, really fast. So the fact that, you know, in this rescue, two people were saved fantastic yeah. fantastic because the water wasn't that cold yet but it was still deadly cold yeah and those are all good the, points mark uh, the whole industry fails to even amongst the paddling community and the instructor community there's not many people that paddle in zero degree water the white water paddlers are about the only ones that are that dumb. <laughs> well, they get, you get equipped accordingly. You, know, you, you get, get equipped. Or the dry but, suit or the, yeah. but you get in the water, and when you feel a face full of zero degree water, or it's like it's the, you know, on Saturday you were camping at the river and the river was frozen over. And on Sunday it's open and you can go paddling, but there's big flotillas of ice going by and you've got to not bonk your head in one of them. But now the first thing you do is, well, you are up and down the hill to warm your body up. Then you put your wetsuit on. No, wait, I forgot a step. You put your wetsuit in the river yeah. to thaw it out. Then you run up and down the hill. Then you put the wetsuit on. And then you run, run up and down the hill to warm up that frozen wetsuit. And you get in your boat. You warm up a little bit. And the first thing you do to prove to yourself that you're safe on the water is you do an Eskimo roll. So you're you're... You're warming up just two, three minutes to get your muscles loose, get your hips, you know, connected to the boat. 
and you're doing an Eskimo roll while you're being watched and supervised or potential rescue by another watching boat, and you do a, an Eskimo roll to make sure that, okay, the cold shock hasn't hurt me so much that I'm no longer thinking. I'm good to go. You do a roll on the left, you do a roll on the right, you do a roll on the left, a roll on the right, and now it's the other person's turn to do one, and you sit there and you spot them. If you have to get out of your boat, I was good at rolling. I didn't have to get out of my boat often, but I pulled a lot of people ashore. And boy, it doesn't take them long before they can't hold themselves. You know, I, I had a little a little short leash with a carabiner on it, and I just clip it onto the back of their their PFD, and I just paddle and pull them to shore because they couldn't hold on anymore. Yeah, yeah, grip strength disappears so quickly. Yeah, right? and if you're going to get back in a boat, you need grip strength. Yeah. Hey, Mark, though, could, I, I, what, what you're saying is fantastic, but, but you were also talking as an instructor, which I think is phenomenal. But let's put this in perspective. Let's say you are a, a new Canadian, just arrived to Canada, and, and it's autumn, and every tourism group is telling you to go out and experience Canada, and you want to go canoeing in a Donkin Park, because that's what you're supposed to do. You are not going to spend the time to take a course with you to actually do all those things. You're just going to rent a canoe and hope for the best, and then something bad's going, going to happen, maybe. And, and Kevin, you're, you're, abs on. you're absolutely right. You know what I just came to realize for the first time ever? If you go to Vancouver and you use an instant teller, the instructions in English, French, Chinese, uh, maybe more than one version of Chinese, maybe Korean, the government services have documentation and websites that have multiple languages on it. And though we might not have qualified instructors in every language, our warnings should be in multiple languages. Well, they, they should, but the thing is, so what, I, what I'm getting at is, what's going to happen is if, if that particular person or family finds out that they have to do all those things that you're talking about to go out for a paddle and to be Canadian, they're not going to do it. And okay, that's but well, I'm does... not saying they have to go into white water and, and taste cold temperature water, but they should know they should have a little bit of a better idea of the risks involved. Maybe well, not I, as much absolutely, as... Absolutely. So don't get don't get, get me wrong. I'm not saying yeah. that. But I'm saying that the, the, worry, the worry that I have is the moment that they think they have to take a huge course to go out in a canoe to actually just experience a half hour paddling, they're going to do something else. Okay. I want to say one thing and then I think Ethan, uh, Ethan should Hi, Ethan. Uh, say something. Hi. Um, you know, outside my door, I go down to uh, to the end of the block and there's a sign that the local government has put up about, um, you know, help that's available to people whose minds are going on them due to COVID and, you know, various bunch of things. And it's in like eight languages, right? It's, it's in English and French. It's in Spanish because in Quebec, almost everything's in English, French and Spanish. Uh, it's in Chinese. Uh, it's in Korean. It's in, I think, Arabic and um, Farsi. Okay, maybe that's where you start, right? You're going on to Opiongo. Here are the warnings you got to know. Like, and they, you just hand this paper to people. You have like 12 copies of this warning, or you have a big sign with a whole bunch of languages on it, just sort of outlining some of the dangers of Opiongo. And every year, somebody dies on this lake. Are you confident? Because that thing that Martin was saying about you know, about the Grand Canyon, <clears throat> to me, what, what stuck with me, and, and you hadn't mentioned last time we discussed this, Martin, is the polaroids of dead people, right? You know, vetting someone who wants to go down the, the, the side of that canyon, which I would not be able to do because I have a deathly fear of heights. Um, that's a nice step. Having, the you know, photos of dead people is grim. <laughs> but, you know, having some sort of warning, universally understandable, I, I haven't, I've never gone to this lake, so I don't know. Maybe there is a huge danger sign. But, um, like, I used to, <clears throat> when I was growing up in, well, when I was growing up, when I used to spend half my year in uh, North Vancouver, my sister and I and my dad would go uh, clambering around Lynn Canyon. Okay? Lynn Canyon is beautiful. It's just beautiful. There's a suspension bridge. It's not like a big tourist draw like the one in Capilano, but just beautiful. And man, every year someone went down 
and died or uh, like there were plaques all over the place uh, you know sarah so-and-so was killed by a falling rock while sunbathing at the bottom of the canyon this person slipped while walking their dog little plaques everywhere you know at last time i went there as an adult they'd put up fences everywhere so like uh, the, the stark dangerous beauty of the canyon was gone but i guess fewer people fell to their deaths um, and like there was a, a whirlpool where people like a deep because uh, at the bottom of the canyon as is usual there was a river and there's a whirlpool that drowned people all the time and there's a, a rock where people used to dive down someone would bounce himself off the side every couple of years and die you know people will find ways to kill themselves not on purpose but people will injure themselves or kill themselves in every beautiful, adventurous spot we can think of. But is there a responsibility on the part of the people who run the place to either put up fences like they did at Lynn, uh, if, around Lynn Canyon or put up warnings or vet people like Martin was saying? And uh, Tenenbaum said that uh, at West, there's a, a trail where they do that. They, they sort of make you take a... Um, an orient uh, an orientation um you know and the, there are two ways to look at something like this right one darwin award you know you, you know the dangers you do this you f up here's your darwin award another one is look come and enjoy our our space try to do it safely here are at least some guidelines <laughs> You know, because I, I I agree with what with what Kevin said earlier. When the shift hits the fan, there's no language barrier. You make signs, you get them to hell to shore. <clears throat> but in terms of what what Krista was mentioning in her uh, in her in her um, blog post, is that maybe there should be a multilingual training at the sort of whatever is the organization level in Ontario, Paddle Ontario, Canoe Ontario, whatever the you know sort of the organization that runs a lot of um now the thing is if a tourist comes through and, and decides to go on the lake the overall training aspect doesn't count anymore right but is there a is there a is there an answer here to that question even but uh before we uh i want i want ethan to get a word in and then we, we can open this up i i think um kind of speaking from uh the younger <clears throat> less experienced backcountry paddlers like myself i've only been doing it for a few years so i kind of consider myself relatively new in it um i'm guilty of it too but i think one of the main struggles is humbling yourself to nature i i know that when i went on my first solo trip my first ever canoe trip to algonquin i i, I did not get enough information like i did a lot of research online but going to the outfitter and getting the canoe I should have asked a bunch of questions and got a bunch of useful information and talked to everyone that I could. And I didn't, I was too proud, too excited too just ready to get out there and experience it and just learn. And honestly, I kind of suffered for it quite a bit. My first trip was not very, very fun at all. And luckily nothing bad happened, but it could have, it really could have my, I mean, this, you, you need to humble yourself to nature and learn and get some experience before and get some experience before you do anything crazy like especially crossing opianga like i i'm still sketched out about crossing opianga it's big and there's a lot of wind on that freaking lake so it's I, I think just being too proud is what it might have been a big downfall for the person who unfortunately lost it, their life there's some cool stuff happening in the side chat here that i i haven't been on top of at all but um Tenenbaum just reminded me of a comment in the blog post that like um why not have a rating system like they do for ski trails or or some hiking trails right black diamond green square blue circle or whatever it is you know uh, you know you must be or you should be it is strongly suggested that you be this level paddler before you take this lake or that river kind of thing um uh, i and i i had totally forgotten about that so thanks for uh, for reminding me of that about that ten and bomb does that sound to me that sounds like it's is one of the easiest ways to deal with this especially because as um canoe hound said he says that when you register at algonquin they give you regulations fire but most turn it into fire rather than read it 
all should be required to sign a waiver. I mean, these, you know, you go to a ski hill and a lot of this stuff happens, right? Jesse, if I may interrupt you, I'm sure that the people who are renting canoes sign a waiver. For the people who are coming with canoes and you're just using the parking lot, and I'm not right. sure if there's an entry fee or not, then that's different. I'd like to give you a little bit of an idea what it's like when you're uh, renting canoes or giving canoes or kayaks to beginner paddlers. Um, when I was on the West Coast, I was approached by um, a motel group that had a waterfront property and they rented these little uh, 10 horsepower boats. They had an inboard 10 horsepower and they would send people off fishing, but paddling was becoming popular and they wanted to buy a little fleet of, of sea ki you know, kayaks maybe 12 or 14 footers. And they wanted an idea of, you know, what were the risks involved and how could they go about doing this? And mm -hmm. so I demonstrated for them, you know, okay, well, this is how a beginner gets into a kayak next to your dock. And you're going to recognize a beginner an intermediate and an experienced paddler by, you know, how they feel right there in the boat, right next to you. In yeah. a place like Opiongo, it's huge. You don't have one or two docks. You have a dock that's, I don't know, it's been a few years since I've been there. It's got to be a hundred feet long. And so you might give your attention to one or two canoes within a group and oops, you might miss one boat through not, not through negligence, just through the quantity of people that are coming and you don't want to hold them up for half an hour or an hour. They want right. to get down to, they want to go to, get down the lake to their campsite and get a fire going and get settled in for the evening. Right. Yep. So you're balancing a whole bunch of different things. Maybe you know that the wind is going to come up and you want them to leave quicker and get down the lake quicker. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I can't surmise what was going on. I don't know what the weather conditions were, what the forecast was. And I, I have an idea what the weather conditions were during the rescue. But, you know, that's only being what I'm reading. I wasn't there. Well, that's the thing. None of us were there. So, you know, I'm not going to no. try to steer the conversation into that kind of territory where, you know, well, this is... You know, I understand that, you know, Kevin was very clear about that um, up front. And I, I'm grateful for that because yeah. I, I didn't want anyone to get the idea that I wanted them to put themselves in that in that position. But I know that you guys have all been on Obiongo Obi before. So yeah. you all know at least what's going to happen. What now, now here's a However, I have been on that lake and on that dock that you're talking about many, 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 many times where I've seen people leave and thinking, they're going to die if they continue. And I went to the Ontario Parks uh, um, cabin and I said, they should not be going out. Like, why aren't you stopping them? And they said, we can't do that. I went, well, you got to do something about that because yeah. those people should not be heading out right now. And <laughs> I have photos that actually one, one article I wrote for Polly Magazine, they had to turn it into a cartoon. So nobody actually knew who those people were. The guy was literally sitting on the back stern of his Grumman canoe, loaded with so much crap, smoking a cigarette, going into gale force winds. And I'm thinking, are we all like we're all sitting here watching him do it? We all know he shouldn't do that. Why isn't anybody in the government telling him, oh, by the way, we don't want to give you a permit? And, and let's say you have uh, a 16 or 18 or 20 year old, uh, you know, a youth who's renting canoes, summer job. Uh, normal for waterfront jobs and there's an aggressive foreign <clears throat> person who really wants to go paddling and he's not going to take no for an answer. You have my money, let me go. It gets tricky, right? They've signed a waiver and well, but to you're a right. extent, you know, like look what Tenenbaum says here. So we begin with the fact that Parks Ontario takes no responsibility here. Is that not a problem? Well, it has to work that way because as soon as they open the door and accept responsibility or liability for anything, they, you know, then the lawsuits start, right? So, I mean, when you go to a provincial park just to take a little day hike, right, all you're doing is using their parking lot and walking their trails, right? Maybe using a porta potty along the way or something like that, right? But, okay. I mean, that permit that you bought for your car, right? There's it's a, a parking lot of permit. It's a, it's, but it's a liability waiver. Read the fine print. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know that. I know that. I've uh, <laughs> so they all I've, have uh, to do this. Yeah, they all have to do this because otherwise they wouldn't be able to operate. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, half a dozen, you know, lawsuits. You know, you don't have to lose a lawsuit to be you know, to be ruined financially, right? And these parks are not just—they're not rolling in dough. You know, <laughs> um, 
they, they'd like to do a lot more if they had more money. Uh, the last thing they want to do is uh, have to budget for lawsuits, right? Uh, so I think that's why they have to operate that way. It, it sort of behooves us to be sort of educated. What I think what we want is we want them to have a responsibility that only goes as far as as warning, not making judgment calls. You can't go. I'm looking at your boat here, and I, you know, I, I'm the dock master. I'm the harbor master. I'm not letting you go, right? But from a harbor standpoint, it's at your own risk. It's all at your own risk. It's up to you to make the judgment call. It's not on us. We, then we're infringing on your freedom, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. It is, but I really want to make the, the statement really clear because I've actually gone to Ontario Parks many times about this uh, throughout the years. They actually do a great job in telling everybody how to, to camp at a campground, mm -hmm. but they take your money to go in the interior, but they do nothing to make sure that you're safe in the interior. Not one educational program for that. And when I asked about it, they said, well, we don't want the liability. They do not have any programs, nature interpreters, do not have the liability, this is what I was told, to go out and show anybody how to canoe properly at the campgrounds to go in the interior. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. That is complete, that has to stop. Those people, if you were a, if you were a business and you actually had a park and you take people's money to do it in the interior, but you didn't do anything to make sure they were safe? Really? You'd be on the hook, right, for like, negligence and, and the answer i got when i actually went and said and they said well gee kevin it'd be great if you did that uh we can't do that because our nature interpreters don't have the liability to go on water to do that well then but you're a park yeah your business is to get people into the park in a on a cruise ship and if you go back in time they did i mean even to the point and it's really funny to just to make, make everybody laugh about this go to that old video um crickets make me nervous it's, it's, oh, tonight, after this, watch that. It's an Ontario Parks video that was made in the 70s. It's called what? Crickets, Crickets make me make nervous. Oh, okay. It was done by the government. And this guy shows up to go on a canoe trip in Killarney, and he, he, he's driving a Pinto, and he's like, and he's got the song going, uh, he shoots his scores, he shoots his scores. He's a, this cool dude, and he does everything wrong, and then the, the rangers show him what to do right, to go in the interior. They won't do any of that now. Kevin, I'll ask you a rhetorical question. Are you perfect? Oh, yes, baby. <laughs> yeah, so makes three of us here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the government, the government has the same problem, right? I, I remember uh, battling Can Transport Canada. Hired two ladies in the early 2000s, and they put together a great little video about canoe safety. And so here they had the equipment list and they reminded everybody and they encouraged people to wear their life jacket and all that kind of stuff. And they showed the canoe with the bailer untied in the boat. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Because yeah. the people who did the video weren't paddlers. They were video no, they were people. Video they, were from, yeah. they were from video schools. You know, they, they had those qualifications, oh, but oh, they what didn't. If, what if having it outdoors and I go on a trip together and we videotape it? That'd be, yeah. Yeah. So... You know, I mean, I'll if people want it. to inform themselves, they can. If people, you know, uh, you have a few bad experiences, oops, I, I need to learn something. Uh, I go to Opiongo and, and holy smokes, the waves are huge here. Uh, for me, that's no big deal. For But for beginners, it's a big deal. Yeah, you know? but I'm not saying that they have, it has to be by, by regulation, but I, I'm I'm it, but it, but it, it does get tricky. The government doesn't want the liability, and that includes aerospace. Even in aviation, the government has pulled back and let the industry take on more responsibility and, and, and ownership of the responsibility of making sure that the fleet of aircraft are airworthy. Okay, at first, so at the risk of sounding like a pinko, that's a terrible idea. I think that, you know, whenever the government pulls back from safety-related things and lets industry self-regulate... That's a recipe for, well, no you would, you would <laughs> Jesse, you would think so, yes. And yet aviation in North America has never been so safe. Would the last 10 years have been phenomenally good? I, I do know that Algonquin Outfitters uh, on Opiongo um, do far more for safety of people going out there than actually the um, uh, Ontario Parks. Uh, 
I mean, what boat saved those those people that actually, uh, well, not, well, or attempted to save that man that was uh, that died, right? It was actually the outfitter that did it. So yeah, they, they that, have two boats, right? I know the outfitters at that particular spot. They yeah. they really do believe in what we're talking about. They're more frustrated. They're there every day seeing this, right? Um, I'm not saying every outfitter is like that, but I, I do know the people on that particular dock um, feel this. But you're right too that we shouldn't make them the owners up up for this, right? So, but then, and of course that doesn't say that that doesn't help for in, in cases where people you know borrow a boat. Yeah, but what are, what are we going to get? Are we going to have then someone in a uniform um, at, at a public launch, every single public launch in Algonquin, saying, "Show me how to paddle before you're allowed to go out." I mean, if we do that, nobody will go paddle. Yeah. You and I will will, but well, nobody. Yeah. It's yeah. it's very tricky. The spectrum for that. What what if what if you say like um, that's kind of like saying every car dealership has to be responsible for every person driving the vehicle off the lot. Well, no, but we have we can't, we, can't, we can't get a license though. I mean, you can't purchase a car without a license, without the insurance and all that stuff. So yeah. the state already imposes that. So dealerships don't have to have no such responsibility. But if the state had you know wasn't issuing licenses and making people um, you know, pass tests and stuff like that, then somebody would have to. Otherwise, it would just be Mad Max out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't know how it is in Ontario or the States, but in Quebec, you can't drive your new car off the lot without insurance already. So, I mean, yeah. you know. Hi, Dennis. Oh, I had a student in Meech Lake. Oh, God. Where's your kitsch? <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, I had a student in Meech. <laughs> when I was in Ottawa, I had a student, and uh, he phoned me up and said, uh, you're offering courses? I said, I teach once in a while. I said, I'm a little bit hefty. I'd like a course. And I said, okay, you need a boat. I don't have my own boats for somebody your size. So he said, okay, I'll go rent a boat at the canoe's place. And I gave him an idea what to get. He told me he was about 250 pounds. He was feeling a bit hefty. I get to the beach. He was about, yeah, between 350 and 400 pounds. The boat that he brought wasn't going to float him, but we tried it in the water just to prove it to him that it wasn't going to float him. And I said... I can't teach you with that boat. In fact, you know, it might take a canoe and it might take, you know, a really big, long, wide canoe because you're not really compatible with these kind of sports until you've got some basics down. Right. I, I, I just sent them back home. You know, it's like it was easy. But for an organization that's either a business or the government to turn somebody down and say, here's your money back, go away. Oh, uh, you're you're almost more liable when you do that than when you let but, somebody go who might be questionable. But what about that idea, the, the the ski hill idea, before? Like this is a double black diamond lake. Well, would you would you limit that to like what provincial parks or what? Well, I mean, how far do you take that? It's just going to depend on conditions. I mean, I mean, Opiongo, you can cross Opiongo effortlessly on a nice day. Yeah, that's right, windless day. When, right, so you're going to have to be changing that sign and based on weather conditions. Well, is there and a warning course, sign on on that lake somewhere, or I, is there I, like warning when you're renting? Because not. maybe that's the secret. Then I mean, and and like I'm I'm using Obiango because that that's the example we've been handed in a tragic fashion, right? <clears throat> but like, um, even to, to to what you were asking, well, every ski hill, private or public in in Quebec, has a system of you know shapes and colors for how how hard something is and, and maybe you know like i've seen stuff you know this trail is you know a beginner trail in good conditions but bad conditions make it much harder kind of thing and like at the end of the day maybe maybe it, it stays the wild west right you know you pays your money it takes your chances you go out you die well hey that's what happens. Well, I, I think there's a, there's a, I'm going to introduce a, a, a wrinkle here that, that uh, might make some people bristle, but. You've always got to be uh, introducing wrinkles, eh? Uh, sorry. Okay. So um, it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's, it's a point that, that I think is right. And it actually mitigates my own uh, desires in this matter. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. That, yeah. It would be nice if there Bless was some, you. some kind of, required instruction it would be nice if we required people to wear pfd so uh but but there's this other uh side of this and that is those of us that go into the wilderness want to experience something 
right? Yeah. Every time someone dies out there, every time someone is hurt, every time someone is lost, we are reminded of the fact that this is not downtown. This is the wilderness. Stuff happens. It can go very, very wrong for you. It's dangerous. Yeah. That's part of the appeal. That's I was part about of to say that. that maybe it's that's not, part of... It's not just an aesthetic experience of being in the beautiful colors and nature and smelling that's the flowers. It's, it's a test of your metal, right? Uh, yeah. Men especially have this. I think a, a lot of guys have this idea of wanting to test their manhood, right? Good or bad, that's part of our sort of evolved sexual psychology. It's part of the evolved sexual differences between men and women. Men have this desire more than women. Women have it too. There's plenty of women um, thrill seekers out there, but more so among men. But there's a lot of guys who wouldn't jump out of an airplane and wouldn't go throwing themselves uh, down a waterfall and uh, in, through rapids the way um, Mark does or used to do, right? But who love the idea of, of going out into remote wilderness. Right. Uh, uh, and it is part of the danger. And this is going to sound weird because, you know, I have never had a Garmin uh, spot device, uh, uh, an in-reach device. And I go out... <laughs> Out on Crown Land, ain't nobody there <laughs> that's mm -hmm. going to find me. And I go out there alone, right? I know it's not the most prudent thing. It's a calculated risk. I know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And there, are, I've been doing it long enough that I know some of the risks and some of the consequences. But there are undoubtedly risks that I do not anticipate, that I am not prepared for. If I, if I go on a solo canoe trip, you know, you look at the map, you look at the satellite images, you know, you're reading the water, you think, okay, there's rapids there. It, it's happened to all of us. If you've ever gone down, you know, and there's some rapids and you think, oh, I did it, you know, and there's no more according to the map. And then you hear that sound ahead of you and you go, what the heck? And then you go, oh, rapids I didn't anticipate. Oh, no place to get out. Oh, I'm committed. I'm just shooting this and hoping for the best. I'm just rolling the dice. Now, yeah. you know, this all sounds exciting and, uh, you know, in, in, in hindsight, it sounds kind of thrilling, you know, because I'm alive to tell it, right? But, yeah. you know, when you're in the moment, it's really nothing short of terrifying because you don't know what's around the corner, right? There could be a ledge, just a huge drop off, you could kill yourself, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so that this is part of the appeal of, of wilderness. And when people from the city go out, they want to go to Algonquin. They, it's the back country, as they, right? It's the interior. It doesn't matter if it's a front country lake lined with cottages. Right. This is nothing like anything that they have in their own countries. If they're immigrants, it's, if they're if they're city dwellers their whole lives, it's nothing that they've ever seen and experienced. They want to get out there, yeah. and the, the the fact that you can just pay your pays your money and take the boat out uh, induces uh, a certain confidence that it's got to be safe. That this is like an amusement park ride. Right. Now that's where the danger is. That's where the where where I think we need to work on something. But I think we have to tolerate a certain amount of fatalities, just like we do on our highways. We just have to tolerate some fatalities. I mean, we could reduce the fatalities on our highways tremendously. Everyone's only allowed to go 30, miles, 30 kilometers an hour. We can do that, right? Fatalities go way down. Oh, we're not going to do that because we think it's worth the body count. This huge body count, it's worth it to go 100K, right? <laughs> or 60 miles an hour or whatever. Um, so there's this, we think that it's somehow worth it to let people die so that we can test ourselves in wilderness. It's a weird thing, but it's a real thing, and it is part of what gets us out there. Uh, and it's easy to lose sight of it when you've been doing it for a long time and you feel so comfortable it doesn't feel dangerous out there, but that's still part of it, right? And sometimes and when, when you get to the point where it just it doesn't feel dangerous anymore is when you can slip up because you're not on your guard anymore. I mean, that that's true yeah. of the outdoors as much as it's true of anything. You know, sure. I, speaking as someone who spent five summers working in carpentry, um, <laughs> I'll tell you some stories at some point, <clears throat> you know, where guys who've just been, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. Bam. Hammer yep. in the head or whatever, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm really, I'm really glad that Martin brought that up, though, because I've done a lot of solo camping and, you know, on the water and in the woods on foot. And I've gone off trail. Nobody knew where I was. And because nobody knew where I was, every single step I took was important. Every yeah. single step involved risk. And so every single step I took, whether it was in the snow or on, on dirt or in the mud, was, a, was an important step to take 
with this with the due care that it demanded because nobody was there to help me out right uh but i have a lot of training and a lot of experience and a lot it made some of that experience is gained from hindsight from having made bad judgments over the years you learn from mistakes yeah and if i get myself into trouble i can get myself out of trouble unfortunately in the case of this particular situation on uh, lake opiongo the people involved were not able to get themselves out of their own trouble they needed help which is part of why we have communities of paddlers and why we have you know why we help each other out when we get into trouble as as humans um and ideally we like to hope we can save everybody but we can't you know when, well, when it comes right down to it though a, a lot of these circumstances come down to the old it won't happen to me adage right yeah. it, it doesn't happen to me well you know what you think these paddlers went out that day and thought one of them was not going to be coming home no it's not going to happen to me right so they take undue necessary risk because they don't realize the potential of what can happen out there or the risk that's involved with you know who knows was that his very first time in a canoe we don't know, oh. right? Three of them in a canoe. There, yeah. There's another recipe for destruction. Right. That's why I was and, you need to be there, comfortable when it comes to nature. You can't just be too proud to learn. Like, I, I don't know everything. I don't, I don't know half of everything. I, I'm always willing to learn something new because I know I don't know everything. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad that this conversation went here um, because I feel that in some ways that's me you know i do often think nothing will happen to me mm -hmm. and i've gotten into a couple of situations in in the back country where that's been thrown right in my jesse face you know oh yeah boom now what um and i, I also i'm speaking as someone who didn't ever learn to um to swim until about eight years ago no seven years ago and it was just due to me you know paddling around in in a backyard pool right at the point where it's a shot some of you guys here know this story and i'm gonna bore you with this but some people don't you know in, in an in-ground pool shallow and then foomp, and then deep and i was just right at the you know the part where it goes from shallow to deep and my eldest daughter camille who everyone who's been watching my channel a lot knows went right into the deep end and went right to the bottom curled up right right at the bottom um and she was like two and i i have no recollection of the whatever minute or 20 seconds or whatever that happened next but i do know that she was out of that pool and i was feeling very differently than i had right before that happened and so the next day i called and got swimming lessons if I'd been on Opiongo, like to me, what I want to know is, is it less dangerous to just follow the damn edge of the, of the lake, no matter how much longer that is, you know, uh, or do I just, because I'm not going to be the strong enough, I'm not going to be a strong enough swimmer to get myself out of that situation. I know that. I depends, not know necessarily, that. Jesse, yeah. not necessarily. Depends which edge. If you're on, on the leeward side, mm -hmm. I'm say the wind's going this way. Okay. And the lake is stretched out this way. And, and, and and I am just, um, hey, Nate. Um, so the, the wind is mostly cut off, right? And, and then I'm fine. I'm, I'm in a windless environment. If I'm uh, paddling along the opposite shore, the waves and wind are pushing me into the shore. Onto the shore, onto the rocks right? or whatever. I, yeah. and, and believe me, those waves are going to be curling, right? Those are the waves that are really going to roll you, right? You're not going to be able to paddle your way through that for very long. Um, so it really depends. Uh, and of course, I've been on, on bodies of water where there was really no no high vegetation that created a windbreak. Yeah. So there was, there was no effective leeward side to be on. Uh, so the smart thing to do was go straight down the middle because that was the shortest course as opposed to going around the long way along the edge. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, actually, we, uh, <laughs> we got blown back. We, we, my wife and I, we needed a rescue. We were in a provincial park. I can't remember which one it was. Is it called Long Pine? I can't remember. Somewhere in southwestern Ontario. So long ago. Very, very early when we started battling. And we were, um, uh, it was extremely windy. And my wife and I were still fairly new paddlers. We had a 16 foot prospector. And we were just, we could not fight the wind. And I knew that the 
part of the difficulty we were having was that my wife being in the bow and not knowing the, the proper control strokes uh, was not able to sort of plant the bow of the canoe. Um, she, uh, she, could, she didn't know how to do a, a, a pry or a jam at the right moment. Right. So I had the brilliant idea, honey, let's switch. So in big waves and big wind, I said, honey, let's switch. I don't know how we switched positions in this empty boat. It's just bobbing like a cork, right? But we did it. It was so stupid. It was right. so stupid. Um, and, you know, the, the thing to do was what we ultimately did. We gave up. We let the wind push us back to, back to a, a, a beach, uh, sort of guided our way uh, to a beach with the wind at our backs. So we stopped fighting the wind. And we just called for a rescue. And we were in a place where we could call for a rescue. So we weren't, but we were windbound. And so it, it took a, yeah. a, um, a a park official in a motorized boat uh, to come and get us and tow our boat. We got in the boat with him and towed our canoe behind us. And, you know, somewhat red-faced. I mean, it was exhilarating. We had a wonderful time, actually. It was an adventure. Um, and at the time, we were sort of laughing about it. It was it's only with the advent of some experience that I now realize Man, that that was really way more dangerous than I appreciated. Even when we we gave up and realized we were defeated and could not cross this windy lake, right? That was more like yeah. a pond, actually. I mean, it's amazing. Even after it happened and I needed a rescue, I didn't appreciate the danger that we were in. But we were. We never think it can happen to us. Yeah. Nate, I want to hear from you because of what uh, Kevin said here. He got he got off so that you could come on. Um, I guess you know what we're talking about. Um, but he says that Algonquin Outfitters um, is sort of maybe the gold standard in how to, to deal with, with with this kind of thing. I, what, we've, what I've been asking is, you know, do you create uh, the same kind of iconography as ski, uh, ski hills have, right? Easy, hard, intermediate, depending on conditions kind of thing. Uh, do you create uh, – well, actually, every time I've rented a boat, I've had to sign a waiver, so – Maybe that makes no sense, but you know we're looking at stuff. And, and um, Kevin was saying that that Parks Ontario is bloody useless at this because they're afraid of um, um, litigation, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so I don't know. What's your take on this whole thing? Um, it's extremely tricky, and it's a touchy subject, and it uh, remains a topic of controversy no matter what happens uh, every spring and every fall uh, particularly more so this fall because of the tragedy that occurred on Lake Opiango. Um, we do our best as an outfitter to screen people who would like to rent our canoes whether that's for a day or for three days or seven days beginning at a certain date when we collectively feel that the seasons have shifted to a much colder temperature. Um, it's not to say that it's a perfect science. It is not. Um, you know, we all have those days when we get two days in October when it's plus 30 or feels like it is. And uh, we get the days in September when it's minus five. Um, so it is by no means a perfect science. And we try to leave that in the hands of the rental managers at our individual locations to screen customers who would like to rent for those dates. Um, and that is not easy. And I'll tell you why. Um, particularly this year with the absolute hunger for people to be outdoors, uh, whether that's because they've been cooped up because of COVID and they feel the desire to be drawn closer to nature or whether that's um, because of the restriction of their other travel opportunities uh, where they want to experience travel but have to do it within the province. Um, and that is because that desire drives people to often misrepresent their skills uh -huh. um, or the truths about themselves and their abilities. Um, I can't speak exactly to, this, to the decision that the staff made at a Ropiongo store, but I can tell you it wouldn't have been made willy nilly and uh, without consideration of the paddling abilities of at least a few members of that group at the time of um, uh, booking um, their trip. You're going to read a lot of accounts about that particular incident on Lake Opiongo. Um, 
And what I can tell you is that everyone is going to have their own particular take on that. And the end result is that it's still a tragedy. Um, we rent a lot of three seater canoes for many, many reasons. Um, one of those reasons is because of the desire for families to want to go on a trip together. Um, and the other reason is to balance out the number of a group of people who would like to all go on a trip together, uh, but no one wants to paddle on their own. Uh -huh. The problem with some of those three seaters, of course, is that um, they're designed to hold a lot of weight. Um, and so oftentimes you need an optimal load in those for them to balance or, or trim out correctly. Um, uh -huh. When you combine that, um, when you combine that with really windy conditions, which there were that day, uh, it makes for an extremely tricky paddling situation for any paddler, regardless of their skill set, in a boat that long in that kind of capacity. Um, the people that came upon the scene, I believe, did their best. And likely, due to their actions based on the accounts that I've read, likely saved the lives of two people and were unable to save uh, the life of the third person that was in, in the water for that long due to exposure and, and hypothermia and the results. Um, it was not due to lack of a PFD. Um, it was likely due to lack of paddling experience. And again, I go back to <clears throat> I go back to the desire for people to want to extend their outdoor experience in the year based on the uncertainty that COVID brings us going into the fall and winter. Um, and that often leads people to make decisions that they otherwise would not make based on their own experience level. Um, <clears throat> there was a language barrier. Um, but at least everyone knew to wear their PFD. The other thing we constantly struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we continue to struggle with this daily at this time of year, because people want to paddle like they paddle in the weather where it is that they live right now. Right. London and Windsor and Kitchener do not have the same temperature that Algonquin Park has on the same day. And so often they base their want for adventure or a paddling trip uh, on the weather they experience when they walk outside of their condominium right. on a London day in October. And so that can lead to some very well-meaning plans, but without any foresight or actual research can lead into a situation like occurred uh, on Lake Hopiango. Okay. Um, what I would say is that we screen people constantly. We say, I would say this, after, after Labor Day weekend, we say no more than we say yes to people. We lose business on days when it's 25 degrees out and we would rather lose that business than more tragedies occur than like what has happened we say no more than we say yes and it's not easy to do because we know we're heading into a into a season where we don't have that same amount of business and of course any business like that is appreciated but right. it, it it would weigh on our collective conscience and it weighs on our collective conscience right now when something like that happens because of of, a, of one single tragedy that has occurred but we i will tell you this we 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 ask a lot of information from the people that want to rent in shoulder season. Um, we make sure our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted on all of our waivers. Mm -hmm. And we do the best we can. We do the best we can to screen the applicants that would like to rent our equipment to travel to backcountry sites in the off season. Do we do it perfectly? No, it is not a perfect science and People, people often do not tell the perfect truth about their abilities and their skill level or yeah. a, while, a, a, a wide variety of things. And that, and that, unfortunately, is part of the factor that we have no control over. 
We are yeah. not detectives. We are sorry. We are not detectives. We are not CSIS. We are we are outfitters. Um, and I will tell you this: we say no more than we say yes. Interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. And it, it's good to get your. Um... That speaks volumes for a company too. When they, when they look up that much and they screen their people coming in that much, that that really says a lot about a company. They care. They really do care. And I know when I went when I went for my first solo trip, I was this crazy big American guy walking into the Huntsville store, asking to go out on a five day trip. And the people at the counter asked me several questions. More than one person, they would come up and be like, "Why are you wanting to do this? What got you into this?" What gave you this idea? Stuff like that. And it was important questions for them to ask. And I had to reassure a lot of people that it's, it's yeah. important that they did ask those questions. Yeah, these are good points. These are very good points. Yeah, Mark? Can I talk to uh, the point that uh, you just had by Austin's Corners mm -hmm. there about every instructor or outfitter should have the right to say, you know, this year, mm -hmm. if you go out there, the chances of dying are possible. And, and, I've tried to encourage that kind of mentality in the places where I've, you know, been exposed to the, the paddling world. And the industry is a bit reluctant because they don't want to cast judgment on people. They don't want to sour the, the soup, shall we say. They don't want to ruin it for people. And, and they don't want to condescend to people at the same time. Yeah. They want, to, they want yeah. business to flourish, right? Uh, but on, as, as myself, as an instructor on the shore or on the dock, uh, if conditions were rough and people were, um, were, you know, questionable, I didn't hesitate to say, you know, you're not going. However, I worked at the Yacht Club when I was a teenager and there was a member who would always go out only when it was really windy. And in sailing, you have, uh, the small craft warning. And there's another one beyond that. When the winds are over 25 and over 35 knots, you have a, a warning. And if you have to be rescued in those conditions, in theory, the Coast Guard can issue you a fine. Uh, when it came to us at the Yacht Club, we were always hunting all over the lake looking for people to go rescue because it gave us an excuse to go out and rescue them, which was fun for us. Uh, so, the, you know, on the, our particular lake, uh, things didn't really happen because we were looking all the way across the lake with a telescope to make sure that we had an excuse to go rescue somebody. And when they got the boat over and they brought it back up, we were all disappointed because, ah, uh, we couldn't go rescue them because they didn't need a rescue. That doesn't happen on Opiongo. And, you know, some people would say, well, Opiongo could have a Coast Guard boat. Well, no, it's bad enough that we have the, the boat that ferries the canoes going back and forth at full speed. You want peace and quiet on Opiongo or, you know, and if you can't get it on Opiongo, you have to go deeper into the park. So. I'll, I'll tell you this, and, and for all the people that are saying, oh, well, the outfitter just shouldn't rent to certain people at any time, at any date, no matter what they say. And to them, I would say, if you've, if you've read the account of the situation, if you think any one of our staff enjoy the opportunity to drive a boat across that lake to retrieve a body out of the freezing water. No, I wasn't saying that then you are sorely, sorely mistaken. And that's going to affect the two of our staff that had to do that for the rest of their lives. So, yeah. And I mean, in, the case, in the case of the rescues I was doing, we were doing successful rescues and perhaps we, you know, managed to get lucky. Right. And I, I we, think that the, um, the, the blog post that seems to be the best account of this because it was by one of the people involved. Um, I, I think that the outfitter actually comes out fairly fairly decently in that um you I know uh, we're not like i don't think that there's any blame to be laid in in this at this point i the reason why the the um the question of responsibility is interesting to me is because of uh the story that martin told earlier about the grand canyon and because of like places where um where someone is at least like where uh I don't really know how to finish my sentence, but well, you know I, there, there are certain cases where the people who run the park or whatever will at least try to not vet you, but sort of what's your skill set before you go climbing down a sheer rock face into the Grand Canyon kind of thing? 
Sure, and and well, I, can, I agree. Can, I agree with that, and and I think vetting should occur. Uh, no one's going to stop anybody from lying, of course. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple caveats in there, and one is something I think Martin alluded to before. But I mean, you know, at a, at a certain point of, of being responsible for yourself, you know, we're at. I mean, we're at a point in human evolution where I'm just not really sure what's going on that way i mean we got to a certain a certain point where everybody learned not to eat not to eat every mushroom you saw you know growing on the forest floor right how did we figure that out right so <laughs> well <you> know, <laughs> through a deadly experimentation right right so and and somehow that somehow that communal knowledge got shared to the point where now you can read books about how you're not supposed to eat every mushroom on the forest floor and everybody right. knows it's pretty common knowledge that you know you you should your kids shouldn't eat mushrooms off the forest floor. So, you know, are we just at that certain point where everybody should know that they you know everybody will hopefully know going forward that they shouldn't go canoeing in certain conditions and should always wear wear their PFD? Like, is it is it just a point of human evolution where we're just at like I don't know where to go from here because it wasn't too long ago where we had to force people to wear seatbelts, right. Or not to smoke in their vehicles. You know, it's just kind of one of those things. Yeah. So, I mean, as Tenenbaum says, what could be done better then? Right. I mean, like, is there anything that can be done better? I mean, you know, big warnings everywhere in like 12 languages, you know, during, you know, certain months, this lake is dangerous or, you know, I, or is it just like, do we just, is it just a case where, no, this is dangerous. People have to understand that and let the chips fall where they may. So much. You can't fix stupid, honestly. It really nope. comes down Martin, to it. Martin, you were going to say something. I want to hear what you were going to say. Yeah. Uh, well, to Ethan's point, you can't fix stupid. That's true. But I don't think any of these people were stupid. At least I, well, we don't have any reason to think they were yeah, stupid. Maybe. Right. I, well, no, I don't even think they were careless. I think they did not know the dangers before. Yeah. That. We, we, the way we always put it is we say, well, you know, if you're going to take risks like that, you have to expect it. But there's a difference between doing something that's risky and taking a risk. When I take a risk, I understand the risk and I take it, right? But I sometimes do things that are risky. I'm not trying to take any risks at all. I might think I'm being perfectly safe. That's what I mean. I mean that time, my wife and I were getting you know, we were just blown around uh, on this, and it, 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 effectively a gale. And I decided, you know, if if the heavier person, me, were in the bow, the bow would sit deeper. That would, you know, afford better control. It wouldn't get blown around. And I know the, the the bow control strokes better than my wife does. Let's switch. That was absolutely lunkheaded. That was a, a dangerous, dangerous maneuver. It's a miracle we didn't both end up in the water. Uh, I didn't know how dangerous a move that was in those conditions. I'd never tried anything like that, right? Um, I would never <laughs> try anything like that. I wouldn't want to try something like that in flat water. I would say, let's let's go to shore and then switch. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I'm not even you know in flat water conditions on a calm day. I'm not going to say, hey Ethan, you and me, let's switch paddling positions right here in the middle of the lake. It's a bad idea, right? Well. So we got away with it on that that occasion, which is why I felt kind of like, hey, that was great. That was an adventure. That was a heck of a thing. You know, it was only later that I realized, oh man, that so could have gone another way, right? Could have gone south in a big, big way. Yeah, yeah. So we got we got lucky. So we were not taking a risk in the sense of we had calculated a danger and anticipated the consequences and decided to go full steam ahead. No. I didn't understand what the consequences were. I didn't even realize what the risks were. So I, I did something risky uh, and that would have been consequential without knowing what the risk consequences were. I wasn't taking any risk. So now from an outsider, you go, boy, that guy's an idiot, right? And I, I think I, you can forgive a person for thinking that I was uh, idiotic. I look back at myself and go, boy, that was a dumb thing. But that's with the benefit of hindsight. That's with the benefit of knowing better, right? But so when you don't know better, you don't know better. And so, you know, you got to excuse that now. So, when people are going out and doing things and they don't know better, what are you supposed to do? Like, if a person said, "Hey, I want to try jumping out of an airplane," well, whoever is saying, "Yeah, you can rent my airplane and rent my parachute and go ahead," well, there's going to be some instruction, some considerable instruction involved, right? 
because the risks and consequences there are extreme. Now, the risks and consequences of paddling across a lake to get into an interior lake or something like that on a, on a long weekend are not as great, right? The risks are not as high and the consequences are not as high as jumping out of an airplane, <laughs> okay? So, um, you know, I, I think an outfitter has to sort of, you know, weigh this um, uh, realistically. But consider the example I gave of when I went into, uh, what was that uh, example of? Grand Canyon, sorry, I couldn't remember where it was. When we went into Grand Canyon, they didn't just show us a bunch of uh, disturbing photos of dead bodies, you know, rotting and bloated in the sun for days before they were found. They didn't just do that. Uh, they said, and they didn't assess our abilities. They didn't ask us if we'd hiked before. They didn't sign us up and say, what kind of shape are you in? They didn't do any of that. That was none of their business, right? Um, there are people who are, you know, way overweight who are better hikers than I, right? Um, so, you know, you can't leave it to, to the outfitters to make these decisions. Uh, Tasty and, chips, right? <laughs> they can't size people up uh, on the basis of how many potato chips they eat on a live stream. Um, so, <laughs> uh, 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 and they didn't even ask us about our experience level. I think they could gauge our experience level by what we were wearing and what kind of gear we had and stuff like that. But, you know, we had pretty heavy packs. They probably know uh, these are not ultralight backpackers, you know, used to pack when we had, uh, backpacking in the desert. So they had some sets that we had done some, but we're not ready for this kind of experience, right? But the, the speech that they gave us was the speech that they gave uh, everyone. And they told us all the same thing. You have to have this much water. I can't remember what the quantity was, but it was like more than a canteen full. You have to have that. We will not let you go without a canteen. That's like saying you will not go without a PFD, a spare paddle, a baler, a throw line, etc., a whistle. Uh, they also said uh, uh, things like you have to have a hat. Who would have thought you need a hat? Yeah, you need a hat because there's lots of places in there where it's eight hours in the summer with no shade. Right. Stuff like that. They told us what kind of footwear we had to have. You can't have sneakers. The people that we saw who had sneakers were all people who just were parked at the rim and hiked part of the way down for a couple of hours and then hiked on hiked the way back. Right. Mm. Uh, they weren't people who were allowed in on a permit for camping. They were just day trippers. Right. Day hikers. Um, so and that's how you lose a toenail because you didn't have the benefit of that vetting process. So I think if something like that could go on, if, if uh, outfitters had that kind of responsibility, but I don't know which agency of the government is going to be able to tell Algonquin outfitters, okay, well, you, your office that's at uh, uh, Opiongo, where you're renting these boats, this is what you're going to have to say. I mean, it's pr clearly the people who work there know best what the risks are and what oh, yeah, absolutely. their policies need to be. Right, that you can't have this is kind of knowledge and intelligence that cannot be disseminated from the top down. It's got to bubble. It's too specific. It's got to bubble up from the bottom up. Um, so yeah. maybe, maybe Nate could speak to this because he works in the industry. He's closer to this than any of us. Maybe he could speak to what recommendations he would impose, if any. Is there anything you think that should well, be differently? Be, before he starts, before he starts, I just want to point out this uh, this bit by Stan Williams, who is who says he was there that day renting. Uh, and that the customer in front of him was was pleading for a day rental, and staff kept saying, "Can't do it because of the the wind situation." Um, so obviously, uh, Nate, this is a, a a customer backing up what you had said before that you know you guys will say no if it's if it's really just too dangerous. But I mean, that doesn't mean that you're gonna that 100 percent of the time everything is gonna go right, right? Right. So an, another issue comes up with if someone has. Uh, this is their canoe trip, and they booked this trip for Thanksgiving weekend, and they booked it in July. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, and they show up, and maybe because we were so busy, we weren't able to comb through all the bookings and cross-reference them with the forecast and mm -hmm. call these people and tell them more <laughs> beforehand. Um, <laughs> so it... it that's that's one thing if you have the the manpower and the wherewithal to be able to comb through those bookings and call people and say yeah i know you gave us your money but we're going to give it back to you and so too bad so sad for your trip yeah 
that's the easiest way to do it. The hardest part to do it is when you weren't able to do that and that group of nine shows up for their reservation that they've had since July. Yeah, right. Um, and that's a really tough one to say no to when they're on your doorstep. And they Absolutely. Really, they Nate, really in, this, in this instance, if you're, I don't know if you, if you know or if you're everybody to say, anybody, were these campers or were these people out for a day trip? Do you know? They were campers. They were campers. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah. And so, and so all it takes, uh, all it takes is for one of their group to be experienced enough mm. to handle certain questions from one of the people at the front oh, right. desk in order to facilitate that group getting onto the water. Yeah. yeah. And there were three boats. There were three boats, right? No, there were, there were more. Yeah, there were more than that. Um, in that so, party, there were three, there were more than three? That's correct. Okay. In the article, it said there were three boats uh, and one of them. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so especially with the language barrier thing, right? you know that one person is really going to be speaking for the whole group. Right. That's another. That's another. That's another larger issue that we constantly work on. Um, but there's no perfect solution. We're not going to have a waiver and an information kind of kiosk in every language that we can hope that all of our visitors. It, the logistics of that are mind-boggling. Um, but Nate, what I was it, saying, it, it, no, you finish and then I'll speak. It's something we're working towards. Um, and Transport Canada could do something or put something together to be supportive of the industry. Well, here, to here's, translate here's the point I was going to make. I had languages. said earlier, but you weren't here yet, Nate, <clears throat> that uh, my borough, I live, I mean, Montreal has a bunch of boroughs. The one I live in, um, each borough does... Right now, there are signs everywhere about COVID, okay? They're temporary signs. They're made of that sort of plastic, corrugated plastic. And the sign um, telling people about, you know, emotional help is available and stay two meters and blah, blah, blah. That's all the way down. That's all down the, the main street just to the south of me is in like 12 languages. Like the top 12 spoken in this borough, right? So you got Korean, you got Chinese. I mean, I know. Cantonese, Mandarin, but written, it's the same language. You got English, French, Spanish, um, Farsi, Arabic, and something else. You know, there's there's a bunch of if, if Par Ontario Parks or Parks Ontario or whatever the hell it's called, or Transport Canada or someone posts a big freaking warning right where people go in, in a bunch of different languages saying, you know, in adverse conditions, this lake is essentially a double black diamond. If the wind is blah and have a readout of what the wind is today kind of thing, then I feel that that would, it sounds to me like, you know, your outfitters is doing everything they can to, to play this right. But it seems that above you guys, are ministries and agencies that could be helping out even in small ways and maybe make a massive difference, but aren't. I, and I know that nobody wants liability. I know it. You know what? I don't think no one, no one wants liability, but I think the other problem is, is the logistics behind the amount of taxpayer money it would take to put those programs in place properly for every single access point in every single provincial park is absolutely astronomical it would be very expensive yes that's a very good the point political will it would take to actually make that happen would be staggering uh, and if i saw it in my lifetime i'd be stunned i doubt it would save a single life too that's that's the thing that yes yeah, so you know here's the here's the other caveat in there say you've got a bunch of keeners well well, these people won't rent me a canoe and i've watched enough youtube videos gosh darn it i'm going canoeing and they go to Canadian Tire and they buy themselves a Coleman canoe for $5.99 and they buy themselves a couple $6.99 PFDs from Cabela's and they are going to go to that lake that their buddy told them about and away they go and they flip over and drown. Now, why you got to talk who's bad fault? about me, man? <laughs> so who, whose fault is that? Right. 
yeah, in well, Victoria, BC, on the island of Van uh, Vancouver Island, ships and the roads are very twisty out there. And a few people went and bought themselves some 100, 150 horsepower motorcycles, and two days later they were dead. And the whole community of motorcycle dealerships on the island stopped selling those kinds of bikes to beginner riders by policy and basic morality. Of course, those kinds of riders who want to buy those big horsepower bikes beyond their qualifications would just go to Vancouver afterwards. And also, right. I feel that it's, it's a lot harder to, to, to do that sort of thing in the case that that we're talking about here because of the fact that you know i could walk into canadian tire and buy myself a cheap ass without showing a boating license uh -huh. when a pilot right? takes off at an airport and he contacts you know before he takes off and he contacts the tower and says you know i'm ready to taxi but i have and he says a letter of the alphabet i have quebec or i have papa and it's a code name that says you have the present meteorological conditions and the no TAMs for the airport. So any particular notices that the pilot is supposed to know about, he is telling the tower that he has that information. When somebody is landing at an airport, he also says that he has that information. So he's advising the tower that he's informed. Uh, there's something that sometimes we could have like a video series that are available on YouTube that are provided by the community, not by just one shop, because they don't have the resources to do that. And that when you sign up in conditions or when the conditions are rough, you have to show that you've watched these videos, that you have at least an inkling that there are dangers and that there are sometimes solutions to dangers and sometimes there are not solutions to dangers. And you have to be able to make a judgment call maybe with your partner team or with the outfitter or with, uh, you know, if you've got your own boats, you're on the hook. You're, you're, you're completely self-responsible just to help people prevent themselves from getting themselves so deeply into trouble. Right. You know, it's funny because but here's, here, here's the other thing I think we're dealing with a bit more of like, um, I, I, I like that kind of, kind of programming and that kind of, uh, approach to, approach to it but i would say this and this is a lot of the a lot of the problems we saw uh from just the increased traffic this summer is so so dennis dennis would you go to romania and you didn't speak a lick of romanian would you then hop in a whitewater raft um and paddle down a river Sorry, would you would you travel to Romania without speaking the language, hop in a whitewater raft, uh, and paddle down the river because you've been down a river once in a raft? Okay, so no, not a chance. So where I'd want it structured on it myself. The, where, what are we missing here? What are we missing here? It in we're, we're missing that factor exactly, right? Maybe the parks are, you know, right now we're doing a lot of talking about the onus kind of being on places like AO, right? When it's not on on your, you're, you're doing your part. Maybe the park should be doing more of their part. You know what I mean? Because ultimately you have to have a permit to be able to go right, into your camping. You have to have a permit to be able to, to utilize day use. But but if you park. have a permit, it doesn't mean that you didn't just go and buy a Coleman canoe at Canadian Tire and seven dollar PFDs. Exactly, and you that's also, what I'm saying because a lot of people do come with their own equipment. Right. Right. So, Not everybody passes through AO. Right. right. But and you also don't you don't you do not need a pleasure craft operator's license to own a canoe or a kayak or any self propelled vessel. You only need a pleasure craft operator's license to operate a motorized vessel right. in Ontario waters. Um, so at, at the point where you're like, well, the, the permit, you know, the permit should be, uh, the warning and the, the mitigation against litigation. It, it, it just doesn't pan out because you don't plan for the people that buy their back. Their friend buys the backcountry permit and their buddy shows up with the canoe. Hopefully they have enough PFDs and maybe they have enough paddles. Or maybe that's where... See, I, I understand why it's so hard to solve something like this. There's no cut and dry solution. There isn't. There isn't. But 
it seems that I mean Obiongo takes lives not on the regular, but often enough. But there's got to be something. And I understand what Nate was saying about it would be too expensive to put a great big warning on all the on all the uh, the, the um you know everywhere people put a canoe in. I understand that. I mean, you know, Venice is sinking because there's no government that is willing to put that kind of money into saving the city from disappearing under the waves because you're talking about a generation project. You're talking about probably hundreds of billions of euros. And any government that puts this project into action will definitely get voted out for costing the populace too much money. You know, so it's when you're talking about public money, it's always really, really iffy. Everything's really, really iffy. If you don't live in Quebec, by the way, because well, our, I mean, government, our government wastes money like no tomorrow. But well, like, Martin, Martin, who should? At what point should just people be responsible for their own actions? Yeah. Well, well my okay. So my view is <clears throat> that uh, all you can do is is really post warnings, and I think the, the suggestion that we post warnings in all these languages is just sort of a that is a conceit that we have living in a multicultural. Um, uh, country. Uh, other countries do not bother with this kind of thing. You know, no, if but they we have do fair, live in a multicultural country. Yeah, yeah, but that, that's we have just decided that we're multicultural, mm -hmm. right? There's lots of. Uh, you can go to Europe. Practically every cut, every country in Europe is more multicultural than Canada is. <laughs> They're just replete with cultures. They just don't define themselves as multicultural. They just say, "You're in this country. You learn this language." You live in Italy, we speak many languages. There's one official language, right? We, we don't bother, we, we don't feel that we have a responsibility to, to sort of pander to whatever uh, a population's um, composition is. We expect that when people immigrate to the country, they're going to acquire the language. We don't expect that they can acquire it uh, immediately. I mean, adults can't acquire a language and become fluent immediately, it's just, just impossible. Um, <clears throat> but, um, I mean, a population, I, yeah. Occasional individuals can do, it, of course. Um, so, so I think we have this weird idea that you know we can just throw up all these signs in all these languages. And you're going to have a sign the size of a bus, right, with, with the same information repeated. No one's going to read that sign. No one's going to walk up and down that sign looking to see how it's written in their language um, and 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 read it. It's just not going to happen. And, and when they do, they're probably it's not not, it's not going to change their behavior much, right? The the kind of thing that I had when I was at the Grand Canyon was very very different. You're not going anywhere until you listen to this talk, because mm -hmm. we're only letting 12 people in. Do you understand? You're going to do yeah. exactly what we say. You're going to go to our shop where we sell the hat and, and, and the canteens, and you're going to go there and buy them, right? Because there's no other place to go because we're right. locking the door. You know, you got an hour to get this done, and then there's, we're going to let somebody else go in. Right. So they, they sort of had us in a, in a, in a, in a way that... that is not comparable to this kind of situation. So I, I think when 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 you can impose that kind of thing, you can. So I don't think that the government can just sort of uh, impose these kinds of things. I think things like you know PFD use. I think you can legislate that, just like you can legislate seatbelt uh, uh, use. Um, and that's taking into account the the objections, very good objections, by the way, that, that Mark raised. I mean, they they give me pause to reconsider this position that uh, that I advanced earlier. I'm sticking with it tentatively now, but. Um, but uh, so that's the kind of thing that uh, a, a government can do. And then it will take a generation or two uh, before it actually works, because things like seatbelt laws, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid growing up, seatbelt laws came in and most people weren't wearing them. They just blew it off because they had not worn seatbelts their whole of their driving lives. And right. suddenly they were required to and they objected. And my mom and dad, they, they fussed and any excuse that they could find to not wear it, they didn't wear it. And now everyone wears a seatbelt unthinkingly because that's just how these things unfold. It takes time for, for these to become cultural values and assumptions of, of responsible usage, right? And the problem is canoeing is a particularly Canadian thing. It's like igloo building. It's just, it's one of these weird things. People come here from other countries knowing nothing about canoeing and, and Canadian wilderness and the risks of cold water in autumn. You know, they have no idea about the risk of paddling in waves. They're just enthralled by the romantic idea of getting out into the wilderness in a canoe. And, you know, Tourism Ontario and Tourism Canada promotes this and encourages this and celebrates this. And so they come up here and they think 
it's a park. And the word park, most people connotes the same thing as amusement park. It's yeah. got to be safe. It can't be deadly, right? And, you know, that's what I think. About country parks, though, they are kind of, you can... You can well, I mean, if you read if you, sort of, if you read the fine print on Algonquin Park, even it says that it offers you a wilderness experience. It doesn't call it wilderness. I mean, mm. if you look at the I mean, just look at the Google Earth satellite imagery of Algonquin Park, you will see a lot of roads back there. All those yeah. logging roads. I mean, it's look when you're paddling through Algonquin, right? It feels like you're in wilderness. If you crash, if you park your canoe on the shore and you crash through the bush, you're going to hit a, a logging road, right? right? It's not remote wilderness, right? It feels that way, though. It's an illusion, right? Uh, and it's a it's a great illusion. It's an illusion that's so that's so effective. People go back to it year after year after year, and they get to enjoy exactly what you would experience for the most part, what you would have if you were really out there in a remote area, right? It's it's the remoteness without quite that much remoteness. It's the experience okay. of remoteness without actually being remote. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the glory of it. But people hear that it's a park and they think, oh, it's a park where you get to experience Canadian wilderness. So, hey, I get to experience Canadian wilderness, but in a safe park, right? And right. I think the fact that it's called a park is, is a problem. I don't know what else you, can, you could call it. I mean, what we call these things is all very legal, but I think that's part of it. It connotes something different than what it is. And what mm -hmm. it doesn't connote is the dangers and so I think putting up signs in multiple languages isn't going, going to work. I don't know that we can legislate uh, much beyond PFD use. PFDs were not an issue in this case anyway. I think that we just have to recognize that part of the allure of, of uh, wilderness travel is that it is inherently dangerous. dangerous. And there is a body count associated with it. And we have to just eat that. That doesn't mean you don't do anything. But I mean, if you just if the money that you put towards putting all these signs, for instance, all over the place, that money just put into traffic enforcement on 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 the four hundred or the four hundred one would save more lives. Right. Yeah. I'd bring um, up one risky point. Okay, and this is the elephant in the room because we're after eleven now. So we're after eleven. The elephant in the room is that Canadians are nice people, and we don't like to encourage our immigrants to learn the effectively learn the less the languages of Canada in a maybe in a timely manner and we don't I don't think I, I knew somebody who did teach English or French to to uh, immigrants and it must be rather difficult I just imagining how hard it is to learn a new language and you know you're learning English or you're learning French it's got to be horrendously complicated you throw the complexities of backcountry canoeing into it. It's like oh, the challenges are, you know, I, I I can't imagine, you know, Nate, uh, if I said anything that seemed contrary, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, we used to have fun doing rescues, but because we saw them right in front of us and we went and did them and we brought everybody home, it wasn't the same for your team. I think that's a good uh, place to to end i think everyone's made some good points i'm really glad that nate came on because uh he had a perspective that i think we really needed um i think uh this was a very good a very good live chat and i hope i feel that we did but i i hope that we did the subject um the the justice that it, it requires and that we maintained respect for the person who unfortunately lost their lives and to everyone involved um, so I'd like to thank everyone who came on tonight. I think um, this was a good chat. I really enjoyed this, and I learned a good lot. Stream, Jess. Yeah. So um, to everyone who's in the side chat and everyone who's on screen, um, see Thanks you next week. This. See you next week, and stay safe, stay healthy, and stay sane. So until next time.